show. Today I'm being joined by another top member of Team Jim 01, coached by the amazing Brian Adams. We had his teammate Nordi Nejo on the other day. The talent coming there out there is absolutely unbelievable. He's picking up titles so early on in his career already. It's Mr. Elliot Toy Boy Hoy. Hello, mate. How are you? Yeah, good, mate. Good. Thanks for having me on. Sorry about the technical issue there. Always happens. That's, that's all good. No stress. I blame Corona. <laughs> but, you know, it must be driving you guys nuts, mate, because um, I've watched a lot of your fights, you know, I've watched, and especially when you fought Shamsul, I thought that was an incredible fight. You showed off a lot of your skills in that fight against literally a veteran. I think it was 16, 17 fights, you know, he's had sort of mm -hmm. thing. And, um, no, mate, it's great to see how, obviously how well you've been rising through the ranks, mate. So what have you been doing with yourself? You always fight. You're always fighting quite regularly. It must be driving you mad, not knowing when your next fight is. Uh, yeah, it's a strange one. It's the, it's the longest layoff I've had from competing since I was 15 when I started fighting. So it's been a strange one, but it's been nice because I've been able to like not have to diet all the time. I can focus on different aspects of training and it makes you appreciate a little bit more. You know, when you're fighting so often, you can kind of take the experience for granted and then it gets taken away from you. And you're like, I know that I'm, I'm ready to go when things come back because it's, it's a luxury to be able to fight. That's it. And as you know, nowadays, it's it's hard to find the right opponent. Like Half the opponents like to drop out. Like You've had a few cancellations, last minute step-ins, haven't you, yourself? Yeah, yeah. I've had, as a, as a pro, the only person who I fought who was my original opponent, that I can think, I was two. So I've had nine pro fights and two of them, no, three, because Shamsul was one as well. So I had Shamsul, um, Victory, victory fights and one more then the rest of them were all late notice replacements like people picking up injuries or people just bottling it or whatever <laughs> <laughs> well they see your style mate it's a very gritty style mate you know they know you're going to bring constant pressure for all the rounds mate and well i said as a, as a pro you're yet to see the final bell aren't you uh so far yeah so far but that's going to come soon enough i'm sure these guys are getting tougher and tougher I'm sure we're going to start grinding out some decisions yeah, but at the end of the day, you do it really well. I said, you keep that constant pressure on, which I think works really well for you, and it just shows your levels of cardio as well, because these guys don't know what to do. Like, no disrespect to Shamsu. I watched, I watched. obviously, he's a fantastic fighter, but you just seem to, like, it's it's like the Khabib style, I call it. You don't beat them. You just make them give up almost, don't you, sort of thing? Yeah, I try to. I try to. Um, the style is just to make them make a lot of mistakes, try not to expend a lot of energy, and then... Um, look to just kind of pour it on from there it was kind of the last one the fight you said you're at before my loss was kind of the opposite of my usual style where I was like up until the end of the fight the first round was pretty close he came out super fast I mean, you saw the fight I'm sure yeah, yeah yeah he came out super fast fast super hard and we were like that's gonna happen this guy's undefeated not have many fights he's gonna come out hard and then he started to slow down towards the end of the first and then I was winning the second round and then out of character went for some, I was trying to make something happen that wasn't there. You know, I was trying to force a takedown. I was like, I'm winning, but I was, I was coming off of the Shamsul fight where it was much more dominant. And I think in my head, I was like, I'm not dominating. I need to dominate. I need a takedown right now. And I forced a takedown that wasn't there. And that was what ended up being the sequence that gave up my back. And then I got choked out, which is interesting because usually my style is don't make mistakes, let them make mistakes, put the pressure on and then see where we go from there. But it was a good learning experience. It's um, it's not going to happen again. Well, it's good to see that's the attitude you've got. And I think Nordine said the same thing. You know, when you went back to the gym, you know, you've got the attitude where you not you don't give up. You just see it as a learning curve, and you want to get better, sort of thing. So, what I've what what um obviously it was a last minute replacement. And as you said, coming off Shamsul, he's as I say he's a veteran of the sport pretty much, and you did dominate in that fight. So you're right, maybe mentally. You were thinking, well, I should be able to walk over this. Not not saying you 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 obviously, you know what I mean. Said the guy, you'll be easy, but you probably were very confident going into that, mate. Must have been. I, d I definitely think it was a mixture of that of being o over confident, over eager to look dominant. You know, like winning winning is enough, especially when guys are good. Like just because he was two and zero doesn't mean he's not going to go on and, and be good. That but I think I was I was definitely trying to force the issue and look into. I guess be impressive but winning is impressive enough and I w it, it was coming on but yeah, I know what you mean I was I was trying to force the action I think I was trying to live up to my own expectations of finish fights finish fights which is just like guys are too good especially at flyweight like everyone's everyone's good when you get past a certain level like you, you can't finish everyone it's just not possible 
Well, I'm not surprised you're all pumped up for your fights, mate, and obviously want to get stuck in because the fan base that you bring, mate. I've got to get mm-hmm. me one of those T-shirts, by the way, man. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 I'll get one sorted. But the but the fan base you bring with you, mate, I think it was um it was a shock and obviously I know you've had most of your life at shock and awe, but it was at your yeah. shock and awe fights. I think it was the Shamsul fight actually. And I mean the amount of people you had there, mate, was unbelievable. Do you usually bring that sort of following with you when you fight? Yeah, yeah, the support is big. It's just it's mates from back home and, and where I'm a coach at Gym I One as well, everyone's support and everyone wants to come see me fight. They know that I always like they know the work that I put in, they want to come see it and it's always a good night out. But I think usually, usually I'll do minimum 50, 60 tickets. If it's away, I'll like up north, I'll still do 20 plus. That's crazy, mate. That's crazy. As I said, the main thing is that they're following you around. You know, you're getting all that support and hopefully you get a little bit of money in your pocket as well, mate, to help with your training sort of things, you know, because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm, sure I'm sure at this age, you know, obviously we want to make money, you know, but I'm sure at this age you're just really focused on building building your, obviously your skills, your reputation, you know, and pumping all that money back into your training. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All it's about at the moment is just like, consi- like be- pre- before this was consistently fighting and just getting that experience so that when we do get to the big shows, I've got all that cage time as a pro and uh, I'm able to use that to my advantage. That's, that's mate, that makes sense completely. And, you know, it's just been great watching your career. You're a name that's popped up a lot, you know, especially when I've been matchmaking a lot. It's a lot of ho- ho- so Elliot Hoy, Elliot Hoy is all I hear quite a lot. You know, that's why when I knew you were fighting at Fusion, which is a local one to me, because I've helped market mm-hmm. them guys out um, a bit before in the past. And um, as I said, it would have been great to see you fight and the, the brother, you know, as well, especially because, you know, you were preparing for him, you know. And well, how, how do you how do you deal with that? You know, you had one fight, then it changed all of a sudden, you know. You must have, I know it's a completely different fight. So this guy flew in from Italy, if I remember rightly, as well. Mm, so yeah. Your first international fights as well, sort of thing. And, um, you know, how did you prepare for that? How, like how, first of all, how soon did you find out it was changing? And then how did you prepare for a completely different opponent? Um, it was a, it was probably about three, four weeks out when we realised that Shad had an injury and we weren't going to be able to get that fight going. Uh, it, it's, it just doesn't bother me at this stage because, like, you're going to see different styles the only strange thing was there was no footage because he'd had like some amateur fights and then there was the only footage was like him fighting on a mat like four years ago and like I was fucking shit four years ago like so I can't imagine what he was like do you know what I mean so it's like I haven't had apart from I think as I was saying earlier I've had two pro fights where it was the original opponent that I actually fought back at the pullouts it's just it is what it is at this point people aren't getting paid enough money to go in there with an injury and fight somebody like me who's looking to hurt you, if you're not ready to do it, you, it's not like the the big show where like, oh, okay, I've got a bit of an injury, but I'm going to make 10 grand and that's going to support my family. It's like you're going to make a couple hundred quid. Why take a really difficult fight when you're injured? And then on the other side of it is there's other people that just don't want to fight because they fucking don't want to fight, do they? They don't want to take difficult fights. You know, I call but, them postables. They, they like having their, they like putting a picture up on Facebook or Instagram. Like I've got this fight coming up, just so it mm-hmm. looks like they're a fight that they pull out, don't they? Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a few of those, but um, they're not going to get very far. Like ultimately, people like that are, are frustrating at this level in my career. But like in five years' time, I'll be like, who, who is that guy? Do you know what I mean? Exactly, mate. Exactly, and. I said you're taking on tough opposition, mate, in your career so far, you know, and and again you're taking this opposition on after, you know, finding out like a few weeks before and your fight. So you know you've, you're experiencing it all at a young age or at a young, especially a young age and at a young point in your career. You know, at least it's not happening later on, and you know you know how to adjust if you need to, which is also good because you could always jump in if someone else pulls out. A hundred percent, yeah. You want like if everything goes perfect in your career and you're you're always fighting easy fights and you know who it is and you've got no injuries when you go in. Like, what happens when you get to... What happens if the UFC call you in two weeks and you're like, oh, I've, I've got an injury, I can't fight. No, you have to You have to have these experiences, you know what I mean? Like, you have to... You want every possible experience before you get to a big show so that when you go there, nothing phases you. Otherwise, you go there and you'll just look like an idiot. So, at the moment, I'm like, I'll probably lose again as a pro because I'm fighting good guys all the time, but that doesn't mean I'm going to not get to where I want to get to, you know what I mean? You have to have that experience, the cage time, the experience of going in there injured, the experience of having a different opponent, because if you want everything to be perfect, you'll just you'll have one or two fights a year and you'll get nowhere. Yeah, that's the perfect mentality to have. It really is. And it's gonna it's gonna give you great props in your career because you could have easily fought 
nine nine fighters who are like zero and twelve or something, you know. And oh look, I'm nine and oh, take me on, you know. Mm-hmm. But you're seven and two against tough opposition, you know. And and as I said, I pointed out before, the big one that stands out to me is Luke Shanks when you fought him at, um, when you fought him at Bama, you know. God bless Bama, we do miss Bama, but you know, but um. First of all, fighting on Bama for a start, you know, that's what was that your second? That was your second pro fight, I think, and you're fighting on quite a big stage. How did that feel? Um, it was my second pro fight, but I was, I, I just knew the level I was capable of performing at. Before that, where I'd had my pro debut as well, coming off of a win, because leading up to turning pro, I'd lost six amateur fights in a row, but I knew the level I was at, and I, when it get when it gets to that point, you're like, I don't. It sounds stupid. Like obviously you don't want to lose, but you don't have the fear of losing, and we yeah, don't have yeah. the fear because it's like I've lost six times. I've looked like an idiot in front of my mates when I wasn't very good, and I know what it's like to lose. But because I know what it's like to lose, it gives me the opportunity to go on a show like Bama. Like for for example, when I showed up, I was meant to be the second fight of the night, and then it turns out I had sold the most tickets, so they were like, we can't put you on early because all your mates will leave and it will be empty for the rest of the show. So they put me on the uni lad portion of the card later on. Nice. And then I was like, okay, so I'm fighting. There's going to be like, however, I think it had like 500,000 views. But it, I don't know. It, it, maybe that stuff will phase me at some point. But as, as of right now, it doesn't phase me because at the end of the day, it's still a fist fight, isn't it? Like he's going to, he's got the same people watching. He's got the same amount of pressure on him. Like why should it affect me if it doesn't affect him? No, exactly. And um, as you said, you walked in there and these people might be trying to un- maybe underestimate in yourself sort of thing, you know, mm-hmm. but hey, they soon they soon find out the hard way, don't they? You know, and um, sure, Luke Shanks, did. and you know, if you look at someone like Luke Shanks now, he's he's pushing, I think he was, meant to, I think he did, fight, or he's meant to be fighting for the championship in Cage Warriors now against Sami Fedin, mm-hmm. you know, and um, you're still his only loss. I think he's six mm-hmm. and one now. You know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. You, I know, obviously, you must look at that and think, well, this guy's smashing it up in Cage Warriors and I managed to, you know, I managed to beat him in the first or second round, I think. Well, I can't remember off the top of my head now. It was but, um, third round finish. Third round finish. Yeah. So, again, that's got to be such a feather in your cap if you look back at your career already. Yeah, it's a good win. I mean, Luke, now to where he was then, has developed so much. Like, he's gone to a higher level. I've seen his training with those guys. Uh, it'd be stupid for me to be like, oh, he's not. Like, it would be. A, I still think I would beat him because I've improved in this time as well. But Luke's got way better since then. Uh, it's a it's a good win to have, but again, like t- t- once it gets to like two years down the line, and then another year, it just becomes irrelevant. Like everyone's de- at this stage of our career, for, like the first ten to fifteen fights, everyone's developing so fast. So it, it's it's a good one to have on the list, but there's going to be many more. Like it's it's not the biggest name that's going to be on there, you know. No, exactly, and I'm sure, and I'm sure you, you just want to keep active. I know what you're like as well. You just want to keep mm-hmm. active, keep fighting, keeping fit, keeping healthy. And um, I love what you said about saying that you've lost before. You know, you obviously, that's what you, doesn't worry you sort of thing. And Nordine said pretty much the same thing, which makes me laugh because you know, from, you're from the same gym. And he says, yeah. they, he goes, they might win, but they probably won't. <laughs> you know? No, yeah, no. I mean, you, if you're an idiot, like if you're one of those people that goes, I'm going to win every time, like, you have to be open to the possibility that you'll lose or you will lose. Like anyone can lose. Anyone can win any fight. I've beaten people where at the time I probably shouldn't have beaten them. I've also lost to people where skill wise, they probably shouldn't have beaten me. So you're an idiot. If you're, if you don't think you're going to lose, you'll get humbled at some point. That's fair enough, mate. Um, so you were talking about in your, I hate, I hate talking about losses all the time. Anyway, sorry, but you were talking about in your amateur career, you know, you wasn't um, towards the end, wasn't as successful sort of thing. So a lot of people may have given up, there and then yeah but what and obviously first of all what kept you going and two why did you decide to turn pro then instead of maybe having a couple more amateur fights so leading up to that i had on the i guess i was like six and three as an amateur and then so it sounds like i had a great record and i was nine fight amateur but the gym i was at at the time it was before i was at gym one was just not the same level of the training i'm at now like they were, they were good guys and they helped me out loads, but I was training with three heavyweights, one flyweight. And the, I, it's that phrase, like, you don't know what you don't know. Do you know what I mean? So at the time, I was like, I'm training all the time. I'm training hard. I'm training three hours a day. I'm, I'm grafting. But there's a difference between grafting and getting better. Like, just because you're getting tired every day doesn't necessarily mean you're improving. So I had all these wins and I was like, oh, I must be pretty good. And then I lost three in a row. And I was like, oh, okay, but th- maybe those guys were good, blah, blah, blah. 
And I, that was at the time I was coming down to gym 01 with my old gym to spa. And I yeah. met Brian and I saw, and I saw the guys there and I saw like, do you remember James Pennington, James yeah. Weasel? Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. guys like him, James Brum, Brett Caswell. And I was like, these guys are a different level. Like Weasel is one of those people where, I oh, sorry, James Pennington, he would be in the UFC right now, undoubtedly in the UFC. He was that good. And I was like, I'm not training with guys this good. Clearly there's a reason these guys, they, they're not accidentally good and they're here. There must be a reason. So after I lost my third one, I was going to go to Thailand because I just finished like college or something like that. So I went to Thailand because I wanted to move to Thailand to train full time. And I came back and was like, it's just not the same as gym I won. Like the, the level of training and the speed at which good guys are produced is unlike anything I've seen at any other gym. And I've trained at a lot of places. The system that Brian has in place for guys to go from an absolute novice to legitimate certified killer is is very impressive. The only thing I can equate it to is uh, the system they have at John Danaher's where they guys come through so fast and the learning curve is so short. And it's, it's the way that Brian has... Um, has systemized all of our training. So yep. I'd lost three. So I go back to your original question about the losing. I'd lost three and then I had three more amateur fights at Jim One and I lost all of those, but I could see the learning curve just going up and up. Even though I lost those, I knew that it wasn't a fair reflection of my skill. So even though I'd lost six on the bounce, I was so like I you know how it goes in training. Yeah. You know the level you're competing at, and I was like, I'm ready for this. I, any anyone on that pro debut was getting taken out. I just knew the the skill level that I had. Does that make oh, sense? Mate. Yeah, man, makes loads of sense to me. I was because I, I said I was just amazed. I wasn't amazed. I was just so impressed how you just continued on after your amateur career, opposed to just yeah. calling it a day sort of thing. And I want to know what changes you made and stuff like that. And obviously, there you are. You moved to G1 yeah. and. You're seeing, obviously, you're seeing uh, an instant of instant. Uh, what's the word? Instant results straight away. And you know what? Brian's obviously got a lot of time for you. I can see when after your sham fight, he came in the cage and I picked you up. He treats you like he, like one of his own mm-hmm. sort of thing. And is, is that what the environment in that gym's quite like? You know, like he, everyone's one big family. He's like the father figure, and you don't talk shit to him, basically. <laughs> yeah, Brian. Brian's in charge, but um, everyone has respect, and also everyone who trains at our gym because you, you don't just turn up and then like if you're a pro you're in the advanced class you have to know all the things that we do to get into the classes so everyone who's in the class has earned their right to be there so it's more that there's it's not like rotating idiots coming in and out it kind of weeds out the idiots if that makes sense because yeah it, do, it does take time even just to get into the advanced class is like a serious you got to put a good six months of training in like consistently so it builds I guess like a camaraderie between the people because they all know like a you know you're getting people good people to train with and b you know that everyone's gone through the same thing to get where you are like eat like i for example when i joined the gym had 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 nine amateur fights but i was still i had to do the same process that everyone else did all the people that had had no fights i had to learn all the drills i had to do this and that to get into the advanced class but I, I, I wouldn't say that I'm out of another gym and joined Gym One. Like I'm 100% out of Gym One. Like I've been there the last four years now. I work there. I'm there all day. So that is my home. Nice, mate. Right? It's nice. Nice that you found you know found somewhere so early on your career as well. Mm, and a lot very of people jump between know. gym. Yeah, straight away you've you know you've you've seen work with the gym before. Got a few skills. You obviously you moved to Gym One and look where you are now. You've been there ever since, sort of thing. And that's just got to be a dream in itself, hasn't it? Not having to bounce around gyms trying to find, oh, this guy's good at sparring, that one's jiu-jitsu, right? I have to go to four different gyms for that and you get it all in one place. Yeah, I'm, I'm extremely fortunate. The uh, the system that Brian's put in place has very clearly got people from absolute novice to like world-class European. And if I'm honest, like, guy, especially, I go back to James Pennington because he's probably one of the best guys to train with him. Brahm as well and Brett Caswell, if they, if they were still consistently training if they weren't in the UFC I would be shocked because they I've trained at like Team Quest in Thailand I've trained at a few other gyms all around the country like top level guys and I've never seen guys at that level but at the same time they started at Gym 01 there's nothing special about any of them like, apart from obviously Brett was a Commonwealth judo but like James James is a perfect example he came from complete novice and got to that level so there's already it would have been harder to come and join if there wasn't already a path but I've seen, like, we had Phil in the UFC. I've seen what, what Brian's been able to do with people. So it was uh, it was an easy choice to make. Did you say you had someone from the UFC in Jim 01? Who was that? Phil Harris. 
Oh really? I didn't know. Yeah. Tra- I, I think I had this. I think I said the same thing to Lord there. So yeah, I didn't realise yeah, yeah. he trained there. Oh, fair play, mate. Fair play. So you've got that sort of level there as well. Joy, it just shows um, what Brian can do for people, how he can mould them, and you know, just get them to the best they can be. And I like the ranking system he's got. It's almost like the military. You come as a private, and then you work your way up, don't you, to general? Yeah, to get yeah, to, yeah. To get to, to get to the um, the advanced classes, and that's probably really important as well, isn't it? That you go through those because, as you said, you go through the ranks first because otherwise you're going to get idiots getting chucked in the advanced class and they might end up injuring one of you lot because they just don't know what they're doing yeah and it also means your training's more efficient because that means i can show up and anyone i train with on that day knows what they're doing it's not like you turn up and there's like oh it's my first class we do, can we do this it's like no nah. if you don't know what we're doing in this class you can't do it so it means that when you get to the class you can just smash the content because you're not teaching anyone the basics they already know the fundamentals that's it mate that's it putting belts on the wall there as well already aren't you as well that must have been a nice nice cut it's not bad winning belts already is it just collect them all up mate collect them all up and stick them on the wall <laughs> but uh, yeah that's it but what was your what's your last title you won was that a victory wasn't it was a victory your last no, one no the victory fights was the first one that was uh last april and then the last one was shock and Aura against yeah. Samsung. Mm-hmm. yeah that was yeah yeah shame man. we couldn't get that third one in there but as you said learning curve mate you're fighting the best people who are going for titles you know what i mean so yeah yeah there'll be plenty yeah. more yeah, so you've grown up through shock and awe quite a lot, you know, through the M- I mean, your MMA career sort of thing. And um, I'm sure you've got great loyalty to them that, that as well. So how does it feel when you fight on different cards, is it, different events? Is it like an away game in football sort of thing? Uh, it doesn't really bother me so much. It's nice fighting on shock and awe because I live in Portsmouth now, so I can just get up, have breakfast and go to the arena. But um, I-, I like fighting on other shows because I like the experience of... Like, when I'm on the big shows, I'm not going to be fighting in Portsmouth. So I, I like the the staying in the shitty hotel and, like, having to find food and wherever you are and the experience. But I, I fought on – I've probably had as many fights – how many fights have I had on Shokunor? 12 now. But I've had 25 fights, so I've had 13 fights that weren't on Shokunor. To be fair, no, you're right. Yeah, you are right. I just see a lot mm-hmm. – I think a lot of the fights I've seen online of yourself as well have mainly been on Shokunor. Yeah, a lot of the ones that are on my topology – are worse are shock and all but there's other shows and there's like striking fights as well like muay thai and kickboxing that weren't on there how did you get on then in your muay thai and kickboxing career because i haven't <laughs> seen any of that so, so i had a it, it's a short-lived career i had a muay thai fight when i was 15 and lost the decision and then i had a pro muay thai fight in thailand uh where i just like wasn't that level and just got messed up i don't know if you can see it. i got a scar here um basically just I got I got to the arena and they were like, how many fights have you had? And I was like, this is my first fight. And the guy goes, no, how many how many Muay Thai fights have you had? And I was like, I told you. And someone translated and he was like, oh, OK. And then we got in the arena and they announced my opponent. And they're like, well done to what's his name? They like they said I'd had like 10 fights. I was like, what? whatever, OK. And then Matey Boy gets in the gym, this Thai guy. And they're like, well done to blah, blah, blah for his 50th fight today. And I was like, oh, shit, this is going to be a fucking experience. So we, we go out there and I'm like, I, at, at the time, I just wasn't that level. I must have been 18. And we the first round was just like a sh- throwing down like wild exchange, whatever you're going to do. But he started landing like low. Car- I was checking kicks and they were landing on my calf and they were hurting. I was like, mate, this guy knows like he knows he's doing damage. And then we were in the clinch. And I come down, like, obviously haven't even fought with elbows before, with my hands low, looking at a knee, and he cuts me straight over the top. I just remember being covered in blood, looking out at this crowd, and we're in, like, the touristy area of Chiang Mai at the night bazaar. So there's all, like, these people that have never watched fighting before looking at this, like, obviously, because I look young now, thinking what I look like at 18, this, like, ginger child getting beaten up, covered in blood. And I just remember thinking, like, this is amazing, I love this. And then I went back for the to the first round. They're like, you want to keep fighting? I'm like, yeah, why not? Like, I've already been messed up. I may as well. Like, I wasn't getting, like, <laughs> I wasn't getting concussed, you know. It was just, like, damage to the legs. I was still throwing hands. I was still landing shots. And then uh, and then he just stopped me with leg kicks that round. I couldn't put any weight on it. The ref was waved off. But that was my uh, short-lived, defeated fighting uh, Muay Thai career. <laughs> Bloody hell, mate. Fucking warrior, mate. Fair play to you, mate. At the end of the day, mate, you stepped in there. When I heard 50 fights, I'd have been out the back door. You know, it, was, but, you know. it was just like, I'd, be, I'd been, I'd ha- through that time in Thailand, I'd wanted to fight the whole time I was out there. I'd had like staph infection two weeks before. I went to the arena to fight the week before and it rained and they hadn't sold enough tickets. So they were like, you're not fighting tonight. So I was like, let's just go, whoever they give me. But I also think they set me up because like a, lo- a lot of the way it works over there is they give Westerners 
either an easy fight and someone takes a fall, which I was like, I don't want to take a fall. So I was like, give me a proper fight. And then they were like, oh, you want a proper fight? You think you can fight Muay Thai? And they gave me some guy who was just like, obviously going to mess me up. But it is what it is. My, it's, It was a good experience. It was like, you, at least I didn't get like fucked up. You know, I just got a cut out of it. Not ideal. But um, stuff like that is experience that you take to get you to that next level, you know? Yeah, mate, especially mentally as well. Mate, fair play. If you know you could go in there in Thailand, in his own country, but I mean, fighting someone with 50 fights and fair play to you, mate. That's all I can say. Do you know what I mean? And, um, you know, that takes bottle. And I don't care what anyone says, you know. If they say, I'll do that, yeah, I bet you wouldn't. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So, no, nah, fair play, mate. And I'm sure you learned a lot of things over in Thailand as well, especially at a young age as well. Did you go on your own? Did you go with that? Yeah, team? I saved up uh, whilst I was at college because, I, like, I got to the end of my A-levels and I was studying and I was like, I don't want to do this. I can't remember just not revising for my last exams. I was like, I want to I wanna do, I want to give MMA a go. So I saved all my money and I just bought a ticket, went out there for, like, six weeks the first time. And I was like, the training here is good. And what I liked is the lifestyle because you just get up, train, go sleep, train again, and then that's it. And all the guys there were top guys. Like, um, do you know Cole Smith, who fights in the UFC now? Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. Cole Smith was there. Mark Abelardo, who fights in one. Uh, Kana Hyatt. Like, some good, some good, decent level guys. And they were all flyweights and bantamweights. So I was like, this is this is ideal for me. Uh, and then I came back, saved some more money, went for another three months. But the, tr- the training is good, but it was one of those ones where it's a good place to go once you're already a refined fighter. Uh, gyms like that where they kind of have guys going in and out so much it's very difficult to develop because they just have so many tourists coming through so it was good for the mental side because the training was hard man like you train hard in the morning you train hard in the afternoon and there'll be no like like how I train now I have like three four tough sessions a week and then the rest of it would be like what I would call lower intensity skill work all of that was like level 10 we're going live we're going hard you're leaving messed up so um, it was a good experience just to be able to do that grind, but at the same time, like I don't think I would have had much longevity there because a I wasn't get I wasn't getting better compared to how much better I was getting at gym one, and b it's just tough on your body to train not so smart all the time. Yeah, man, your health bar is going down like a computer game. You get longevity yeah. in your career, man. But again what a great experience at such a young age you know what I mean uh-huh. sort of thing it's like you're studying all through your A-levels and then before you technically as I say freedom you know go out there and do what you want you fly off to Thailand mate and just crack on so mm-hmm. mate hats off to you that's, that's what I think a lot of people who definitely want to get involved in the sport like it's the first fastest growing sport in the UK so if you're an 18 year old then you've got to do stuff like that now this is the time to do it and being the fastest growing sport in the UK what, what a great time for yourself as well to be involved in this as well you know Mm, yeah it's a good time to be in MMA I'm excited to get back competing when things are going like there's a lot of good guys in the country there's a lot of people coming out of here that have uh, have done some big things and I'm hoping to be one of them no, that's it mate 100% and obviously you, you fight flyweight and bantamweight um, what do you prefer to fight at? so I fought at catchweight as a pro I fought at bantam as an amateur but that's because I was just like didn't really know how to diet I, I am a flyweight but I feel like with the way I'm developing at the moment, I'll probably have to go to Bantam at some point. But as of as of right now, the cut like I'm I'm big for the weight, but the cut is not difficult. Like the most I'll cut in water is like one and a half kilos. So on on the day before, so I'll, I'll diet down from like whatever I diet down from, and then I'll do the carbohydrate manipulation, and I get down. I only have to cut about one and a half kilos, but uh, it just gets harder and harder. So I imagine I'll be at Bantam at some point. Yeah, that's it. What do you, and obviously with the flyweight. You know, fly, there's not that many flyweights out there, as you know. Do you know what I mean? There's not hundreds of them out there. And um, like when you see people like the UFC, when they were talking about maybe removing the flyweight division, like what do you think about like organ- like someone like the UFC thinking, oh, I don't know if we can hold on to the flyweight? It is where it is. It's out of my control, isn't it? Like if they want to get rid of flyweights, that's cool. I'm, there's a big opportunities elsewhere at flyweight. Uh, I do think I could fight a bantam, and I probably will do it at some point anyway, but it's tough to get frustrated by stuff like that because like I have absolutely no control over what the UFC do uh, if they get rid of the flyweight division I think it's a mistake because I feel like the skill set that people have at flyweight is very very uh what's the word underappreciated like guys are always very skilled I think um because DJ was so good and wiped everyone out they were like ah, oh, they can't be very good but it was just happened that because he was so good 
it just made everyone else look bad, kind of like what Amanda Nunes is doing now. It's the same thing, isn't it? But if they get rid of the UFC, at the moment, there's so many other avenues to make money in MMA and do big things that I, I just can't let it frustrate me. No, no, it's all in the sense. It's what they're doing. Like, look at Cejudo. Like, when he won the flyweight title, he still wasn't getting any... Don't get me wrong, the mm-hmm. guy cringes me out, but he didn't get any of the appreciation that he probably should have done until he started moving up a weight class and mouthing off a bit and being a bit weird. You yeah, know, and, um, and I think Demetrius Johnson's the most underrated fighter of all time. No one knows enough about him. You know, like you were saying. Mm, you know I think I mean? the people who know, know about him. But I yeah, get... Well, I, I, I Like, the public, yeah, the public don't know. But... That's just the way it is, isn't it? Talent isn't always appreciated. No, uh, mate, but again, the people who really watch the sport, you know, know what's sort of going on. And that, that's, that's the people you need. And there's two different fans. They're the fans that say, do you do UFC? And they're the fans that actually understand what's going on. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. But at the end of the day, anyone who wants to come and talk to me about UFC or watch MMA or anything, then crack on. You know, I don't, I don't care if you only watch Conor McGregor. At least you're starting to watch the sport. That's you know the thing, I mean? isn't it? It's like when people... people when... Uh... Aaron Chalmers had his debut. We had Cameron Hardy fighting on the card. And everyone was like, oh, I can't believe this guy's fighting. I was like, what are you talking about? This guy's got a massive viewership. If it's bringing more people in, that puts more money in everyone else's pockets long term. Like, It's so short-sighted to talk shit to these people that are bringing publicity to your sport. Like, What are you talking about? It's a win. Exactly. You want you want like people that are from the, the general public would know competing in MMA because then it's just only going to elevate the sport yeah no you're right and um, that Aaron Chalmers I've actually met him at a Bellator press event before you know what top geezer I'll give him of that course, I mean, yeah, what, for sure. what, what a top bloke he is mate and and you know what, um, I was here I don't want to say where I heard it from but he turned down like a six figure contract from Geordie Shaw to keep on fighting in Bellator do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, fair, and fair play to the guy. I never watched the show, but some people who've told me who watched the show said he was always talking about wanting to be a fighter and all that sort of stuff. And do you know what? Fair play to him. He might not be getting given the best opponents in the world, but do you know what? He still gets in there and has it out. And fair play to him. You know, I wouldn't get in the cage. Do you know what I mean? I'd go get a million pound and go get pissed. Like, as he said, I'd go get paid millions and get pissed and get every weekend and stuff. But just shows, mate, you know, once you've got that mentality right, it's the way to go, you know? Yeah, but 100%. Remember, though, in the UK, like you said, Bellator, um, UFC is not all the only route. You know, Cage Warriors is probably the biggest organisation in Europe, one of them, do you know what I mean, sort of thing. And all their fighters, I think they're nearly 100 fighters that have moved to UFC from there. But mm-hmm. then you've got people like Bellator. Look at Bellator, mate. Um, massive investment in the European series at the moment. Mm-hmm. Is that something one day, you know, you'd like to look at that sort of avenue as well? Or would you like to get back over that side of the world, like one championship or something like that? Yeah, one championship is the goal. Um, Bellator don't have a flyweight champion. They, they, they put flyweight fights on uh, in the European series and like on the undercard, but they don't have a dedicated flyweight division. So it's just like, I would, I would love to fight on Bellator, especially in the Europe series. And I'm sure I will uh, get that opportunity at some point, but ultimately UFC or one championship is the goal. No, that's it. Um, sorry, my, my battery's dying. So, uh, that's all good. But, uh, that's it, mate. We're professional. We're, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Tell you what, one, one, F1 championship is getting a lot more popular, especially with the UK fighters as well. Why is that? Uh, why are we going over there, or no, no, why is it? No, what, 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 why is that? Like the last, like say, last five, six people I spoke to, you know, looking at the future in their career, like a lot of people aren't saying UFC anymore. They're saying I want to go to one. Like, why is that? Why is that? Do you reckon? Mm, it's, I'm not sure why other people would want to go because ultimately, I feel like the pay isn't actually as good as the UFC if you're a lower level fighter. But I feel like it's promote it's promoted a little bit differently. You don't have to talk shit. The fights are always good. Uh, I think people like the idea of not having to cut weight, even though I feel like their weighing system would still suck as well. Um, I don't know. I like it because I watch all the one FC cars. Like all the fights are good. I like that they put Muay Thai fights on. Then MMA. I feel like you're watching a Muay Thai fight in the back. You get a little bit more exciting MMA fight afterwards. I just like the way they promote it over there. They have a large viewership. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying I don't want to fight in the UFC, I want to fight in top organisations in the world, but uh, it just looks like they're doing the right things at the moment, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think, as you said, a lot of people have also said that it's the weight cut thing as well, you know, everyone's fighting at their mm-hmm. more natural weight classes, which 
again safer and what you and at one you'll never you'll very rarely hear crowds booing and things like mm -hmm. that as well because it's like every time UFC goes to say like Japan or something there's they would just applaud win or lose you get applauded if it's a lay and pray boring fight they still get applauded you know mm -hmm. and I think it's, it's just the respect for the sport and um what's the word like the discipline of it isn't it their culture is that that's probably mm -hmm. another good reason to go that part of the world as well yeah I think so and uh I feel like the tri fighters get treated pretty well as well like it looks like um, like, do you know, we had a guy called Dylan West, do you know him? I'd probably, I yeah, doubt I it. Well, he, it. he had a, uh, his pro debut on Ryzen a few years ago. So wow. they messaged, uh, Phil Harris and said, do you want to fight, uh, what's his name? Kaiser Minsaiga, who is yeah. like a, a famous Japanese fighter because he's going out with some Japanese model who's, I guess, like a Japanese version of the Kardashians. I don't know. So this guy's famous through her. And they wanted Phil to fight him, and then we were like, Phil can't fight him, but we've got these two guys, and it was either Dylan or Mike, do you know Mike Diego? It was Dylan or Mike were meant to fight him, and they were like, who do you want, the striker or the grappler? So they picked Dylan, and he gets flown out there for his pro debut, and he comes off, uh, turns up at the hotel, and people are, like, random people are coming up to him, like, Dylan West, we want your autograph, we want your autograph, uh, and Brett Caswell was there cornering him, and he everyone was like Brett can we get your autograph because obviously he's a judo guy they all had like old judo magazines and wanted him to sign it like the level of respect is just so much different out there for the athletes from the fans and that just sounds like an amazing experience yeah mate you've got to love their culture over there and just the respect they have for the sport mate I say when we're playing football and stuff they're they're learning sort of martial arts and stuff and discipline you know from a young age and maybe we'd start doing that more in the UK for sure mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So just what I'd like to know as well about you fighters is like, you know, you weren't always fighters, you know, so you said you had your first at 15. So what initially got you into it? Like what were you doing before fighting? And then what made you want to get into combat sports? Um, I think what made me want to get into fighting was the school I was at was very like rugby boy school. Like you're the alpha if you play rugby. And I was I hated rugby. I was small. So I was like, that's not for me. I, I didn't like getting cold either or fucking going and playing these bullshit games that I didn't enjoy. And then my dad's friend uh, owned Z ZT Fight School, okay. one of the original MMA gyms. So that was where I started training originally uh, before they closed down. And I, I basically, I haven't got a cool story. I just showed up and was like, this is fun and just went every day. And then that was it. Were you doing any sort of athletic, anything, any disciplines before? Or did you learn MMA as a whole from day one? Um, athletically, all I did before was play football. Like I did kickboxing as a kid, and I had like an orange belt, but I didn't really do kickboxing. It was just like I, my parents made me go, you know. But um, no, I just started MMA originally. I mean, I probably have more of a striking base because um, I also started at ZT with uh, Kenny Moiston, uh, with Ken Shiro Muay Thai. Yeah, yeah, Kenny. And that he, that's still a, a team that I train with now because like I've been with Kenny since I started. Um, so I had a good striking base and then the MMA was with Pro Systems MMA, which kind of branched off from ZT Fight School. Nice, mate. Nice, nice. It's nice, nice, easy path through there, you know, which is the way to be. You fell into, again, you get the opportunity to just approach, um, let yourself out there and then you took it and that's the most important thing, mate. And, um, mm -hmm. it's always nice to hear how you all got into the sport as well. Some people say they, some crazy stories and some people say, oh, I just saw it. I wanted to do it and I loved it. And that's that's good that you loved it from day one because it sounds like you didn't like a few sports you were doing before that anyway. So, yeah, yeah mate, loving it. Well, before I let you go, mate, and I, I just want to ask a question I'll ask everyone, right? Where's this nickname coming from? Who gave you Toy Boy or, you know what I mean? Or have you got an older bird something like that? What's going on? <laughs> nah, the, so the, it's, it's not that clever. I will give a shout out because I always forget to say it. Uh, my friend, one of my original training partners, Sam Spokes, uh, I was just like 15 years old fighting people way older and it rhymes doesn't it toy boy hoy so because I was so young like I look young now at 23 so imagine what I looked like when I was like 15 fighting these people <laughs> I just look so young uh, but nah, no no older women yet fair enough mate. so that's where fair enough but that's where it came from I was really I was reading toy boy and I kept looking at pictures like right are there any older women taking pictures of him no, <laughs> no. and it was one of those ones where I, obviously I was 15 I was like nah I don't want to be that I want like a hard nickname I want to be an alpha but obviously now it's funny because like no one wants to get beaten up by the toy boy that's just embarrassing I so, love like, it mate you gotta keep it now 
the only person I know of that nickname. And nowadays, everyone's got each other's nicknames, mate. So I love him, mate. Sure. Bit... Otherwise, you might have ended up like another pit bull, mate. You know what I mean? So Yeah, exactly. We've got enough of them, mate, for sure. Well, before I let you go, mate, I just want to let you, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for giving time to chat, mate. It's been really interesting hearing your story, mate. And I said I've watched a lot of your fights, so thank you very much. Um, but before you go, just give a shout out, if you can remember everyone, to all the people that helped you get to where you are, any sponsors, anything like that, and where people can follow you on your social media. Uh, no sponsors. Shout out, Jim01, Kenshiro, Muay Thai, always. Uh, Pro Systems, where I started, because those guys, I love those guys. And then my dad. Uh, always supporting me. Uh, Insta, Elliot Hoyo one Twitter, same thing, but I don't really use that so much. And yeah, that's it. Nothing, no one else to shout out. That's it, mate. Nice, nice and easy. I haven't got a big list. And any sponsors out there listening to this, get on this guy. He's going to be a big name soon. He's winning titles and you'd be stupid not to stick some of your adverts on him, mate. So Absolutely. I hope they're listening, mate. And then it, mate, it's been a pleasure to talk to you and I can't wait to be at your next fight, mate. And hopefully we'll be out the back chatting to each other in person afterwards. 100%, yeah, that'll be good. Last awesome, one, mate. And again, thank you very much. Another great member of Team Jimmo One joined, mate. And it's just a pleasure talking to you all. And Brian, Brian's doing some great things up there. And I can't wait to see what the rest of the world, well, it's probably not the rest of the year, probably next year now. Do you know what I mean? But yeah, we'll see what happens. Yeah, you'll see some big things. I can't wait, Elliot, mate. I can't wait. I'll definitely come and say hello. All right, I'll speak to you soon, fella. Thank you very much. Awesome, mate. Cheers for having me. Anytime, mate. Thanks very much. 